Hello, hello, resilient people. This is Simone, your ultimate social worker here. And I'm so excited because we are back for another episode of the R Stories, where we're able to highlight the underdog stories of people who are resilient every day, going through regular traumas and issues that we face every day, and they're doing it and they're killing it. And I'm so excited because in this episode, I got my friend, my soror, my uh, my co-worker from a distance in education, because if you're an educator for the New York City Department of Education, we all co-workers because we all going through similar things right now. Um, and I'm so, so happy that she's here to share her story. Social worker, educator, therapist, author, founder of Resilient Young Minds, Inc. I'm passionate about serving and developing at-risk youth into resilient ones while coaching adults through their healing. This podcast is my way of honoring youth and adults who have overcome their trauma while still inspiring others. I am the ultimate social worker, and this is the R Stories Podcast, where your resilient story matters. Take away the pain, take away the hurt. story she's going to share with us today that she, but she's overcame so many different things there's one on my heart that I hope she shares um but without further and further ado I would like to welcome please 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 give a warm warm welcome whether you clapping or however you do screaming while you listening to this maybe you watching it on YouTube but give it up for Yasmin Chisholm Jim there you go there you go <laughs> all right hey yes mean hey girl hey hey you gotta tell them about yourself tell us where you're from what you do um just and why you decided to talk today and t share your story hey so i am a bronx native um bx all day and i also am an educator in the bronx even though i no longer live there i have relocated to connecticut um but my heart's there you know and so that's what keeps me coming back every single day to teach these fifth graders ELA. Um, what was the, se the second part of the question? What made you decide that you wanted to- Oh, this story is important. <laughs> um, I think every time I share a little bit about this story, someone in the room says, oh, I've had this situation before, or I know of this situation before. Mm -hmm. But when I was going through it in the beginning, no, like it was quiet, crickets. Mm -hmm. And so what that tells me is that when someone is going through this particular ordeal, especially as black women, mm -hmm. we need to be a little bit more vocal about it so that our sisters can find resources um, or even just someone to lean on who understands what you're going through. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. I definitely understand that. And that's like the whole point of our stories is to, have that moment where like, yo, I've been through that. Yo, I did that because it's when we go through things, it feels like a very lonely place. And it always feels like you're the only one going through it. And it's like pushing yourself or coming out of yourself to talk some, to someone is hard sometimes. But, yeah. you know, the platform is here. Like, maybe I don't want to let anybody know what I'm going through. Maybe I'm afraid, you know, I don't want anybody in my business, but at least they could turn on our stories and, and, and hear some type of testimony from someone that may actually are going through or have gone through what they've gone what they're going through right now so i definitely understand and feel that because 
that's definitely why I um, decided to do this. And I'm glad that you're here and you wanted to do it too. Thanks for having me. So before we get real deep into the meat and the potatoes, I have to say this. I have to have to say this um, because I've seen you post some things and I was just like, I'm right here with you. But there's something in me, like I guess the professional in me or the politician in me, because I've gotten those things before, like, oh, you could be a politician, you could be a lawyer, you could be a this. The corporate part of me, I guess would say, is like, it's just having a hard time saying, because there's more times I want to just go live. Like, there's just some yeah. nonsense that's happening at work. And I just be like, like yo, this person did. And I'm like, yeah, don't do that. This is your job. Your page is public. Yeah. <laughs> they can see what you write. So that's where my mindset is. But um, based off what I've seen you write, there's definitely a lot of frustration and hurt, um, mostly frustration, nonsense, you know, the miseducation of Black kids continue. And, and right now it's miseducation of kids, period. But once again, our kids always get the short end of the stick at the short end of the day. End. Always. So tell, tell how you're feeling right now. What, how's work? I know you're commuting from Connecticut to the Bronx to go to work. How, is, how has that been for you? Um, exasperating is an understatement when describing how this has been. Um, the demands that are placed on teachers, it, it almost feels like, uh, it almost feels like if, it, listen, if we weren't getting paid, it would be slavery. The things that they're asking us to do. That's honestly what I said. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of miseducation of families that's, that's not being put out there. Families are sending their kids to school thinking that these systems are in place thinking that, um, you know, some sort of a response to COVID is taking place. That's not, either it's not realistic or the schools that are trying to put it through are not being responded to by the larger bureaucracy. Yep. And so, but, but at the same time, teachers have to be responsible for keeping the kids safe and keeping them educated and keeping ourselves safe and our families safe and also educating the community and also making sure that nobody um, is suffering through trauma all day long. And we have to make ourselves available. Sometimes I have messages coming in at 9 p.m. I'm a very compartmentalized person. So for me, that is really overwhelming. Once I get home, I do my lesson plan and work is over. Mm -hmm. And it just feels like, once again, teachers have to sacrifice their personhood yep. for the greater good. And I'm not saying that it's, I'm not saying that it's not worth it. I'm saying that it's not fair. Yeah. It's not right. <laughs> That's, that's, that's what I've been um, speaking to, you know, with my team and my staff, because now like, yes, I was an educator, you guys, you know that already, but I've transitioned to social work, but I'm still in the school setting. So my, my perspective is like, I, I can't turn off the educator in me. When I'm in a school, I'm a social worker and I have to enter classrooms, I have to support. And when I see things happening, I, I still respond in a way that an educator would because I was doing it for seven years. That was my first ever job out of college was teaching. So naturally being in that setting, it's like I never really forget how to or, 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 or things that are going on. But I'm the SEL lead. So I don't know if everybody knows about this initiative. I don't know if they're doing it at your school. But New York City is supposed to be a launching the Strong Resilient Schools Initiative, or they launched it. And I, by default, am the SEL lead from my school. SEL is socio-emotional learning, if you, 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 know, you don't know about it. And it's crazy how now they're just doing this because of the pandemic. But the idea that, oh, Kids need to learn so how um, socio emotional skills just as much as they need to learn academic skills and yeah. and now they want to track SEL data and I'm just like so hold up hold up so you want me to make these teachers teach and track SEL data when they don't even got SEL themselves that's one you don't even have time for SEL let's talk not, about new curriculums that are out. And the amount of overcompensation they're trying to do for a worldwide education issue, there's right. not even time in the day. If we if they come in and see us doing SEL, the first thing that most administrators would say in many schools would be, well, what's going on with the lesson? It, by no means am I saying that it should be a separate thing, but the messaging, 
that is coming from above, it makes you feel that way as an educator and you feel overwhelmed. And so now what I notice, I don't know if it's like that in your building. I know I talk to other educators, they're having this issue. It has shaken the culture um, in the school, like the morale and the rapport amongst each other as adults because the frustration is festering and it's coming out. I don't know if it's different from the just the teacher side, but I'm kind of like a little bit in leadership, a little bit like I'm I'm one of those people in the building that don't really have a, a space. But because of my experience as an educator and then my experience as a social worker, like I've 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 done both. I've coached teachers a little bit at my school on on instruction, and I was like, nah, I'm done with this. Um, and but now I have to do this SEL. And so now as a leader, as the site coordinator for your school, now you kind of put yourself, you're forced to be in almost in a supervisory role because mm -hmm. it's my responsibility to ensure that it's happening. But from the educator, like you're from your perspective, you're like, I ain't got time for this. I'm just up. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. I'm coming like, yo, where your SEL? Yeah. I'm getting cussed out. And I'm like, yo, if you need help, I'm happy to help you, but you didn't ask. Mm -hmm. right we're not willing to be vulnerable but yet we so angry about all of this I feel like this is an issue that us teachers need to come together as educators in our own buildings and decide what we're gonna do for what works for our kids mm -hmm. period like I'm not gonna lie I hope you know this is me speaking as Simone Mouchette as a, I'm not representing DOE at this point in time this is just me speaking for myself you know, I still respect them. You know, they still pay my checks. I want to keep my job. It's cool. I'm going to continue to do my job. But I'm saying that I wouldn't be opposed to the dismantling of the DOE. The Board of Education had to be dismantled. And they came up with the department, New York City Department of Ed, right? It was board before. Mm -hmm. You could dismantle it again. Um, I feel like every school should operate independently in a way. I feel I like... Go ahead. You know, some things can get to be some bureaucracies can be, can get to be um, can get into the idea of being too big to fail. Mm -hmm. And at least when you look at that through a corporate lens, it's not true. Mm -hmm. So why would it be true anywhere else? It's this true. is a capitalist society. So if it doesn't work for corporations, it tells you that it won't work anywhere else. And sometimes I can't help but wonder if us being comprised of so many smaller districts, like I, I <clears throat> there's an I there's this desire to overgeneralize New York as well. It's all New York City. Yeah, but there are so many different communities, mm -hmm. even inside of each borough that desire different things and have different needs and therefore should probably operate a little bit on their own, okay? Yeah. And so when we try to put everybody under this giant umbrella, under this unification of New York City, like I get it, I'm a New York girl. Yeah. I really get it. But at the end of the day, I've worked in many different schools because I was a substitute teacher because then I became a teaching fellow and then I had a job right out of there. And then I ended up getting excess because the last one in is the first one out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've seen a lot of different schools and some of them have been in um, districts that receive more funding than others. And I see the type of changes that take place mm -hmm. and also, a lot of times I feel myself at each school saying, oh, well, if only this school had this, yeah. you know, we shouldn't have to have Franken schools. Mm -hmm. The community should be playing an active role so we can figure out what best benefits this community. What do these kids need? Right. What kind of programs do these parents need in order to help their kids? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where it comes to, I, I, I still stand firm. They started it, but it got reneged when the pandemic happened with the, the same thing with being um, first one in, last one in, first one out. A lot of, the goal was to have a social work in every building with under the SAM initiative. And the thing is I got hired under that initiative, but we also lost a guidance counselor. So I was able to stay, thank God, because the guidance counselor left. And as a social worker, you can do that work too, right? So I was like both the guidance counselor and the social worker. So that's how I kept my job. But all the people that left, like schools lost social workers. And the things that you just mentioned, those are the things that I do. Like right now I'm working, we're trying to figure out something going on with clean, right? If anyone doesn't know, if your mm -hmm. kids are 
in temporary housing that come into school with dirty clothes or you feel like they're not being cared for whether they don't have enough money whether they don't have transportation whatever the reason is behind why they're not able to get their kids clothes clean clean right is willing to create a partnership with us to give them a discount and they could drop their laundry off back to school and they'll pick it up mm. so it's like little things like that it sounds little but on my parents I can honestly say they do value me. They do appreciate me because it's like we want to, we got to think about the community. Mm -hmm. If we're going to educate children and that's our priority, you can't educate children and support children without supporting the family. Yeah. Because that's who's raising the child primarily. And we can't do anything with a child without parental consent. So it's like you, it's not, you got to go deeper than just looking at this one kid in my building. You got to see it from that community perspective. That's why I love um, the community schools idea. Yeah. You know, I know that, um, who is it? Jeffrey Canada, and I think it's in Harlem, has a school where they do that really well with the community aspect. That's what I think that we need to start moving. And then it'd be easier to do it one by one because each school will understand that community and can service that community's need. I've done family therapy at my school with mm -hmm. students because they come to school sad and depressed because of things that happen at home, not in the building. So if I'm gonna support this child, I gotta get their parent in on this session so we can rectify this problem to help this child. So it's, it's so many layers and it's deeper and the pandemic makes it worse but it exposed everything. I don't even feel like it's worse. I just It just exposed the nonsense. And now that it's something that affects everybody, like you said, staff member, like we got families too. Yeah. My house is at race too. So you, now it's getting to the point where like, oh, even if your home test says positive, still come to work, what? So I'm, I'm like lost. To me, it's just like when we had a cold, that's what y'all used to tell us, right? Come to work anyway. Yeah. All this is saying is if you're sick, stay home. That should have already been a thing. But we, like you said, we live in a capitalist society yeah. that doesn't value the person individually. They value the money. So yeah. if you can make your money while you sick, that's what the expectation is. And it's, it's, it's disheartening and it's heartbreaking because it's this never ending cycle. Right. But I'm 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 gonna put a pin in it. I just was like, <laughs> I need to talk to somebody. I've been feeling to have this conversation. Yeah about what's been going on and I've been quiet about it, quiet, quiet. Like it's it's on another level. Yeah. It's on another level. But um I'm glad that you're still here and you're still doing it. Cause I'm I'm we may be having another our stories conversation next year, girl. Because okay. all right. <laughs> okay, okay. Cause might be my time. <laughs> but this is my seventh year, you know? But I but I applaud you for making it seven years because the thing is, is that people don't make it that far no more. They, first year teachers be out. Yeah, yeah. I was just explaining that to someone. It's so intense. It's so intense. I really feel bad for these new teachers. Yeah. Because what they're being asked to do is not what I was asked to do just a short seven years ago. That's a fact. It's a fact. Mine is 10. When I, when I became a teacher, I didn't even do ed TPA. Girl. <laughs> My class was like the last class. They were like, they want to switch. Do you want to do it the old way or the new way? I was like, the old way. I had to take my test a year early to be able to get certified under the Amen old way. Amen to that because the Ed TPA was not a joke. And even though it helped me build my 10 year binder, it was very, very, very intense process. That took me a really long time to do. But you know what? I did relay and we had something very similar to that, but it just wasn't as like excessive because I think ETB has to be around 80 pages or something like that. That's what I heard. I don't know. I didn't do it. It's long. Some of it is just is just filling in bubbling in questions and stuff like that. But then other parts, you know, you have videos and um, data that you have from your kids. And yeah. OK, so that makes sense. Like for relay to graduate their master's program, we had to do that anyway. It was called a master's defense. Hmm. And we had to have evidence of different strategies that we use to support kids. Um, how did we do the data, all that. Mine came at 30 pages, but we had charts and all that stuff to demonstrate the data. And we had to stand up and give a presentation, you know, show our videos and stuff like that. Yeah. But it, I don't know, at TPA just seemed more like tedious. 
than than what I experienced with Relay, but Relay, that was a part of their thing regardless before TPA was a thing. So I guess that's what made it feel easier. But I felt bad and I let my, in, in January last year, I let my certification expire. So I'm no longer a certified educator. I let it go. Cause I was like, Lord, I hate teaching. Mm. I don't hate kids. I don't hate teaching children. I just hate the bureaucracy and all that other stuff. I, I, I don't like the demands of lesson planning. I don't like the demands of, of, you know, someone observing me and they want me to teach the way they teach, but they're not here every day. I, I don't want to, I, I, I'm, I'm over all of that aspect of it why I left teaching in the first place but I had wanted to have a backup I wanted to have a cushion like you know what if this social work thing don't work out I always got my teaching degree and I'm in the school so but the more I was like no I'm a social worker and that's that's what I'm called to be that's what my assignment is I'm meant to be in a school which just could have been like the confusing part mm -hmm. but I'm not and I let that I let it go I yeah. let it go I, I've had so much trauma with teaching and, and all of that I just let it go. So I'm just a social worker now. It's done. They said I would have to start over. We know we not, I'm not doing that. No. <laughs> All right. So let's let's get into the trauma piece. Let's get into the trauma piece. Thank you for indulging me in that conversation. Right. Um, but um, so tell us what was your most traumatic moment? How did it impact you? I know you supported Ron in many ways um, in the past, and you've even come on one of our um, panel discussions, Speak Up, Speak Out, and you shared some of your trauma around fertility. Um, would you say that experience would be your most traumatic moment? Do you have um, something else that you want to share? And what did you learn? The infertility issue is the most um, outstanding and palpable trauma that I feel to this day, even though I'm currently pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that a lot of people don't expect. If you've been talk talking about going through infertility, they think when you get pregnant, this is a, you know, you're, you're excited, you're so excited. Um, but when you have experienced miscarriages, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't feel exciting. It mm -hmm. feels worrisome the entire time. Mm -hmm. You worry every single day. You worry, you know, oftentimes women complain about their pregnancy symptoms. Mm -hmm. We are begging for intense yes. pregnancy <laughs> signal. You know, we want to we want to feel all the pain because then we know it's working. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about the second one because this is the, the most traumatic for me. Yeah. Um, the first, the first miscarriage was very, I was only pregnant for maybe not even six weeks. I just knew because I went through IVF. So when you have that knowledge, everything kind of feels very different. And I was excited because we had been trying for three years. So to even get pregnant at that point was like, wow, I can do it. Um, shortly after I miscarried and it was very, it was natural. It was a natural miscarriage. So I didn't have to take any kind of medication. It just happened. Um, and I also was pre-warned because they were doing my hormones. The second one, completely different ball game. Everything appeared fine. Mm -hmm. Everything appeared fine um, until I got my first sonogram mm -hmm. and the baby was measuring a little small. Mm -hmm. At the second sonogram, we saw that there were supposed to be twins and one vanished. And the one that was left behind was still growing a week behind but we got a heartbeat. So there was a little hope because yeah. there was a heartbeat. Um, and then we, I went to see a different kind of doctor because I just, at this point, you get so like obsessed <laughs> that you, you go to get that second opinion. Mm -hmm. Second doctor's like, everything is gonna be fine. You'll be fine. And then I even reached out to one of our sorors who's an OBGYN and I asked her, what is the probability of this? Because now, I, you know, when you get into this, this space in your life, if you have to be in this space in your life, you start taking on all these jobs you never had before. Mm -hmm. You learn all the medical terminology. You are now a statistician because you need to know what are the chances that this will happen to you. <laughs> and you start doing all of these different like research projects. You're reading academic articles to find out about this control group and who this happened to and how old were they and how many children did they have beforehand? Did they have children afterwards? Like it just, you just go down a complete loophole. So that's where I was at that point in time. 
and everything was fine mm -hmm. to my knowledge. And then I went in um, to the doctor and I should have been about 10 weeks at that point. Mm -hmm. And my child was measuring at eight weeks. Wow. No so now two weeks gone home. No heartbeat. No heartbeat. So at that point, it had passed. And, um, but my body didn't know. And even though I had stopped, when I stopped taking the hormones that I was taking to sustain the pregnancy, my body still wouldn't give up. And it was still pumping out progesterone. It was still pumping out estrogen as if I was pregnant. This is called a missed miscarriage. Mm, your this body missed it. Right. Your body just missed that there's a miscarriage going on. Your body is convinced that everything is, is going according to the plan. And it's going according to somebody's plan, but not yours. So how did you know that that happened? Only at the doctor's appointment you found Only at the doctor's appointment. So that week before the doctor's appointment, I took a trip to Chicago to see my sister. She was graduating. It was great. I was sick the whole time. Mm. I was nauseous. I was exhausted. I was moody. Um, Francis had ordered some hash browns and I smelled it coming out of the kitchen. Like it was like, I just, I knew, I knew that at that point, you know, everything's going to be fine because I'm having all these symptoms and they're crazy. Um, mm. But the reality is my body was pumping out, you know, twice as much of everything because it was convinced that I was having twins. And, and in fact, over that time span, or maybe, you know, just when I got back, my baby's heart stopped working. And so when I got to the doctor, um, they said, you know, you can either try to let this pass naturally, or you can take this drug called misoprostol. This is Misoprostol is not a joke. <laughs> There's no words that I can use to describe misoprostol except for the fact that the doctor said, do you want us to write your prescription for Valium? I don't do well. <laughs> is that like the abortion pill? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, so you gotta let, let, let people know you're using the medical terms. I got to help them out. Yes, this is the abortion pill. And for anybody who thinks that the abor an abortion is the easy way out, it's not. It's not. I've always held this feeling. I've always known because I went to an all girls school and you just have knowledge. But when, when I had to experience this, what I, what I took from that is that it's, it's worse than even people who know it's bad. It's worse than you think it is mm. because that pill is going to put you in labor, but you have nothing to give birth to. Okay. So you're going to have contractions. Wow. I was, on, I have a very high pain tolerance. <laughs> I was on the floor. Mm -hmm. I was on the floor, yeah. dragging myself from my bathroom to my bed. It, I've never felt anything like that before, but you know, I didn't know what to anticipate. And I thought it would just, you know, when you, when you go through all these different procedures, some of them are really painful. And so you start to get a different idea of pain and you're like, well, this is, you know, I went through the egg retrieval, so this will be fine. The egg retrieval is when they take your eggs out in order to um, put the sperm in them to make the embryo, to make the baby. Mm -hmm. that's typically the most painful part of things so I was like I got through that I don't need the value if a doctor offers you this if they offer you value they know something they know something you know said when they start pulling out them <laughs> yes I'm like yo <laughs> they know something you don't know <laughs> okay so I learned from that but even after that was all said and done the pain lasted for I'm going to say about four or five hours. The residual bleeding lasted for a few days. Okay. And even though it was a lot, when I got to the doctor, there was still a mass inside of my uterus. Oh my gosh. Like that was the first, if your body and your brain have never been so succinct, I didn't want to give up. My body didn't want to give up. It was trying to hold on to everything that was there. And it was very, 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 very painful. Mm -hmm. um, and so fast forward to November, we do this all over again. I have only, well, no, we did it again. Wait, in October. Pause. wait, wait, I want to, I want that to sink in. So when you had this really traumatic, painful miscarriage, mm -hmm. This was in, in, June. in June of yes. 2020? Of 2021. Oh my gosh, this just happened. This just happened. It's been less than 12 months. You're so brave. <laughs> I think I'm you. So this is June. And now November, you added again. Well, that no. 
October, I was at it again. That's that's crazy. Like that means like you you're determined. You're not gonna allow anything to stop you. You're like this is this is this is for me. Like I want my baby. And yes. That's it. Yes. In any way, in any in any way that I can do it. So, but I did take some time off. So I want to clarify, and just so people don't know that, like I don't I didn't just keep going. Mm-hmm. At one point, that was my philosophy. But after the first miscarriage, I realized you got to take a little bit of time off because otherwise you know, it's going to be overwhelming. So, you know, my birthday's in July. So in June, let's backtrack a little bit. There were a lot of things happening. My grandmother had passed in June. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was just after, my miscarriage was just after she had passed. So I went through yeah this and then I experienced a panic attack at work and that was really what called my attention because I've had anxiety for my whole life I was a child with anxiety okay I've never had a panic attack like this my whole chest closed up the the, the way I thought I had COVID girl because I was like my chest hurts (laughs) I just can't I went to the hospital they couldn't find nothing I was like no you're not looking you're not looking because I'm a black woman you need to look in here do all the tests they didn't find a thing they didn't find a thing. Mm-hmm. I had another anxiety attack, a pan- panic attack later on in the year. And that's when I, that's when it dawned on me that I was panic attack. So at that point in time, I said, I got to slow down because something is killing my body. I don't know what it is. I'm going to slow down. June, you know, the school year is almost over. We need to plan a trip. So we took um, some of the money that we had been saving up and we just took a trip to Puerto Rico, me and my mm-hmm. husband. And um, after that, we took a trip to South Carolina. <laughs> and then we took one more trip to DC and just tried to get away and have fun and just enjoy like you know last year I turned 30 trying to enjoy being 30 um and enjoy this place in my life and you know like there are things to live for you know what I mean this is a traumatic situation on top of another traumatic situation but I needed some motivation to keep going a little yeah. bit. Like, you know, you got to give yourself a little self-care. Yourself sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's called a little self-care. You needed it. self-care. And you needed it to, and you needed the self-care to equate the level of trauma yes. that's needed. Because some of us, we'd be like, oh, I did a little money. Like, no, you right. have to make sure the self-care matches the level of, of healing that you need from yes. the thing that you're trying to self-care from. A warm bath and a face mask wasn't going to do it. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. so um when we got back in September September is really when we went back to the doctor and said okay we wanted to see how everything is going um and the mass was still there um and so I had to go in and have surgery for them to remove it um that you know wasn't too scary because I've had surgery plenty of times in my life so it just wasn't a big deal afterwards everything was looking good and doctors love to say this thing like, you have a good uterus that means nothing to me what, what are we doing with that? That is useless information. <laughs> but they're like, you know, you just, we'll just try it again. So we tried, we did another embryo transfer, rewind. In the IVF, the first IVF, we only got one embryo out of it. Mm-hmm. So that miscarriage was extremely painful because I knew I was going to have to do IVF again. And it's a long process. Could you, could you just briefly like touch on the IVF process? Because you're um, some of my other friends have done it. And I know like you have to, like once you inseminate, the semen into the egg you still need to wait for a viable yes egg to to be so like if you could just really quickly just touch on that so they can understand why you only had one okay so here's the thing um my condition is um polycystic ovarian syndrome and so I have many 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 eggs but they're not growing they're not growing the way that they should in order for me to go through ovulation naturally to be impregnated naturally and so they just kind of sit on my ovaries and build up. So what happens with IVF is that they give you all of these medications to push your eggs into growing. Um, And this works for many different people, not just people with PCOS, but it was ideal. I was an ideal candidate because I had so many eggs that the idea was that they would be able to extract many of them and inseminate many of them. This time um, I learned that the brand of PCOS that I have is brittle. And so some of my eggs are gonna grow huge and some of them are not going to grow at all. <laughs> and trying to get a good number <laughs> can leave you hospitalized because if you if, if you have too many eggs growing at the same time and they're all really, really big, 
then when they go to extract those eggs, they have to flush you with some water that leaves you swollen and you get ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Um, that's just when your ovaries are hyperstimulated or uh, swollen. So anyway, um, after that, they take the eggs out, they put the sperm in them, and then you wait a couple of days, three to five, you get some embryos. I got one the first time, five the next, no, eight the next time, five good ones. Okay. From which I had the one pregnancy. I had another uh, one that didn't, didn't uh, implant and another pregnancy and two of them that didn't make it or something like that. So now I'm pregnant with one and I have one left over. Okay. Um, I didn't think it was going to work, but you can't really get, um, you can't do the genetic testing unless you have three miscarriages. So yeah. So you got to have more trauma. Yeah. So you have to have more trauma in order to get help for the trauma that you have. So, so anyway, what I learned, um, well, I didn't really think about the trauma of all of this until I got pregnant this time, because this time I spent so many weeks on edge, even when nothing was wrong. We went in, the embryo was measuring the way that it's supposed to. And we saw a heartbeat, the first, the first, the first uh, doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. But I was still like, I don't know. And even my husband was traumatized. And he's like, I don't know. I don't want to get happy yet. So we weren't telling people because when you tell people, they're like, that's so exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not. <laughs> it's not um so then the next time we saw the heartbeat again and the baby's growing then the third time the baby's moving and then I got COVID yeah. after getting my booster because when you're pregnant you're immunocompromised <laughs> so um I bled a little and I got scared and I was like this is it this is the end and I panicked and it wasn't the end it was not the I'm end it for you I was scared for you because I had <laughs> in January. Well, well, January just ended, but in the beginning. Yeah. So like I was just like, because <gasps> I didn't go to a baby shower like after. I mean, I was good at that point, but I was like, uh, it's still kind of close. I don't really want to go. And you know, yeah. that's that's scary. And, I, and like you said, like I, I didn't experience that, but because I know you, I know some of your journey and I know how much it means and I know how crazy COVID is. And it's just all of that in my head. I'm just like, <gasps> yeah, yeah. For you, Cause I, I definitely like can understand at least. I don't, I can't relate yet, but I could definitely like understand the, where your fear mm -hmm. was coming from. So how did you, how did you overcome it? How did you come on? Tell me. Well, like I'm uh, cryptic, I'm cryptic. I know you're pregnant now, but I feel <laughs> like it's a happy ending to the story. I'm okay. pregnant now and I'm 15 weeks pregnant today. So the chance of miscarriage is now less than 1%. Yes. Even for somebody like me who has PCOS. So that's really, really good. Um, that chance decreased around 12 weeks, but I was released from my infertility practice at 10 weeks because all you got to do is take meds for the next two weeks, do it on time and you'll be fine. Um, and so I ironically right after the COVID situation I went to the doctor and they were like all right well you don't need to see us anymore go get an OBGYN so um since then I've spent more time I have an additional Instagram page this is not a plug unless unless you want to follow this kind of plug it. what's up do you want to plug it um it is uh devoted to my struggles with fertility and also the celebration of where I am right now. And on this page, I follow a bunch of women around the world who are going through a similar thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really my way of dealing with the trauma of being pregnant after infertility and pregnancy after loss, um, which comes with a compounded trauma because then you don't know if you're gonna have your second, right? And I do want more than one child. So um, following these women helps give me what I'm trying to give right now to others, which is a community um, and well, yeah, a community. Mm -hmm. that, that's my way of, of dealing with this trauma is being in fellowship with people who are also going through this too. Yeah, yeah. I really, 
love and appreciate um, that you mentioned that and that was your way. Because I did, I do know that every opportunity you had, whether it was to speak to another woman or to speak on a platform, you've taken it and you didn't, you didn't hesitate. You didn't question it. And I definitely applaud you for that because us women need people like you. And I don't want to get emotional, but I remember when I asked um, you to speak on the Resilient Young Mind Speak Up panel when we were doing women's health. Um, and that's on YouTube. That's a plug. If you anyone wants to go back and watch it, it's on YouTube, Resilient Young Minds. Um, but I remember us doing the, the, the panel and it was you, it was Karen that I hope that I'll get on in a later show. And um, it was Janelle. And I think Bianca did a nursing piece where she was explaining like the different common silent um, um, conditions. I didn't wanna say disease, conditions that um, women face that can um, impact fertility. And that as the facilitator, like it really impacted me because I, I was motivated by it because I started to see women around me sharing with me their stories and they're struggling with it. Ultimately, because of me, I'm a social worker, I'm a therapist, I understand that's my gift. People like to tell me the business and things like that. But I didn't know how to like tell you that, oh, Karen is going through this. You should talk to her, right? So that's why I was like, let me do this little panel because it's deep. But it, it became even more deep because when you ladies sat up there and told your stories and told us the symptoms, that was in October, right? Because Breast Cancer Month is in October. We did it in October, right? And I noticed from the summertime in August, there were differences in my body that I didn't like. And some of the things that you ladies had said, you were like, nope, that's not normal. Nope, that's not. They want to tell you that it's that's how it's supposed to be. It's not. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to bleed in between. You're not supposed to da 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 da. There's not spotting is not a real thing. Something is wrong, right? And I remember that. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go to the doctor because I wasn't feeling right. Like something was wrong. And so in January, I was like, it was the week of my birthday, and it was the week of my 30th birthday too. And I was planning, you know, birthday things, you, you spy or whatever. Like, you know, when you plan things for your birthday, your period is not something that is invited. The period is never invited. I'm invited, but she will show up. <laughs> but she want to show up, but she want to show up, right? But so that week I'm like tight, right? Because it's early. It's not even like you showing up. It's kind of like early. But what messed me up was that I had my period in January already. So she wasn't even a factor. So this is three days before my birthday, which is, you know, towards the end of January. And I'm having a whole, like, I started bleeding at work randomly. And I was like, what is this? Panicking. I had called, um, my, I had called Karen at the time because she's a little, she's closer. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what it is. She was like, are you stressed? Are you? I was like, I'm always stressed. <laughs> That's true. Not it. Like, that true. can't be the fact that I'm always stressed. That's not it. They're like, maybe you lifted something heavy. I'm like, yo, you know who I'm talking? You're talking about Simone right here. The Miss Independent, always want to do everything by herself, mm. all of that. Like, so I was like, all right, I'm going to take a breath. She was like, we're going to go to urgent care. I even know there was OBGYN urgent care. You telling me, girl, because I didn't know that. <laughs> this, and this is why the community is important, right? Yeah. Because I felt comfortable calling her because of that panel, right? Even though like, okay, yeah, she's my friend, but I have a, you know, there's people that I consider to be friends, but I didn't call them, right? I didn't even call my mom. Yeah. Cause my mom doesn't have experience. Well, you want to call someone who, who you know can either empathize or help. Help, right. Otherwise people are gonna panic. Help. Right? And so we went in there and we went to the OBG, my an urgent care, they took me. I was like, this is okay, this is nice, good to know. And um, she was like, when you go in there, Tell them you want a sonogram, period. Mm -hmm. I was like, really? She was just like, yeah. I said, but I'm not pregnant. This is this tells you the lack of education yeah, yeah. on women's health. And I'm a woman, right? Yeah. I was like, but I'm not pregnant. Well, I need a son. She was like, nah, like, that's not it. She did that. So I went in there. The doctor's like, yo, you got a yeast infection. I said, mister, I'm about to be 30 years old. I've been around the block once or twice. Yeah. I said, I know exactly what a yeast infection is. 
I never had no blood from no yeast infection, mister. I said, I'm not hurting when I urinate. I'm not itching in any shape or form. I do not have any symptoms of a yeast infection. So how is it that you're declaring this a yeast infection? And that has been a diagnosis that I've been getting a lot. Mm. Um, when I go to the GYN, that's always a thing. When I get my pap, they're like, oh, take this. You have a little yeasty. And I'm just like, why every time I go? That this is yeah, no. <laughs> something don't make no sense. Yeah. So I was like, now the it rose out of me. And I'm, I'm remembering Karen's words in the car. She's like, yo, tell them what you want. Tell them you want them to try every single test. They need to find out what is wrong today. Because you do not spot. I've never spotted since I was nine years old <laughs> when I, this thing started till now I never had anything in between that's not normal for me yeah so I'm telling I had to get nasty with this man and he's like okay okay if it makes you feel better I'll do whatever test just to ease your mind just to ease your mind trying to make me play me like I'm yeah. crazy yeah found out I had a fibroid mm. they did the sonogram and that, that was another experience. I didn't know you got to get this inside and an outside. That was a whole yeah. nother thing for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but took it and found out I had a son, a, a, a fibroid, um, which at that moment put me in a sad place mm -hmm. because I'm 31. Yeah, I have, I've had, you know, boyfriends and things like that. And, you know, I'm, you know, I had a life before I was saved. I'm not innocent to that level. I've never, ever gotten pregnant right like all by accident or whatever like how it happened to you know our yeah, peers we were in high school and and, and yeah. college type thing we i never had any of those experiences but i also was not like married to say like yo it's something it's not something i wanted to happen so it doesn't something that i paid attention to but up until this point now it's like whoa okay how long was this an issue mm -hmm. kind of thing because i only got it checked because i had to ask no one offered for me to check these things. And that's the big problem. That's a big problem. And that's, you guys, you ladies, if you guys didn't tell me that, I would have never known. Now I know that I have two fibroids now. Mm -hmm. Now I know that I have to, if I want to consider having a child, I have to take prenatal pills. Yeah. Prior to, you know, I know that that's a thing that during or whatever, but she was like, you will not have to work on properly your hormones, mm -hmm. like starting it off. And then, you know, she gave me the paper. I'm like, yo, this is what yes, me to let me go with yes. <laughs> I was like, mister, you gonna have to give me a ring, sir. This is, this is, this. Yeah, when, when you ready to give me a ring, then we could in, <laughs> revisit this conversation because I know I'm a very emotional and sensitive person. Mm -hmm. I overthink things, I analyze things, I think about the heart of people, why people do what they do. I don't really just take behavior for what it is. And I know people don't react that way and they like, especially not, you know, towards me. And I could be very emo and I need a partner that's gonna be supportive through that process for yes, me to be absolutely. able to, to con even consider anything and you're gonna have to be my husband because this is not gonna be something that you're gonna walk away from Girl, i'm gonna yeah. tell you straight up <laughs> even on the financial side like a lot of people don't think about that um you need someone who has insurance and sometimes it's best if y'all have different insurances so you guys can be each other secondary because this stuff is yeah okay so but shout out to the doe for having a really great infertility care plan Minus the situation with the three miscarriages. <laughs> she said minus this part. I this haven't spent twelve thousand dollars, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> it was getting a little expensive, but uh, I didn't know all the all the things. Now I know some things, and I'm like, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I I definitely appreciate you uh, uh sharing and selling. And I said I was like, I got to tell everybody. Like I learned it from you, ladies. If you got ladies that didn't share it and speak about it, and this is why it's so important for us to talk about it. It hurts. It's painful. We may cry. I don't even care. We could cry all day. But the um, if schools, if doctors, if society is not educating us, right? Whose responsibility it is? It's up to us in our community to take care of each other and and look out for each other and educate each other. You know, each one teach one, one hand washes the other, I scratch my back, you whatever metaphor, term, cliche you want to use. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter, it still holds true at the end of the day. And 
I'm thankful for the community and I'm thankful that you're in the Ron family. I consider you a part of the Ron family. You were a panelist, you know, you share your story, <laughs> you know, you've overcome, you've been to both galas so far, you know, I consider you a part of the Ron family. And I think all the, I think in the beginning, it's going to be the Ron family members that are going to be sharing their resilient stories because it's, it's starting with you all to build that greater community of, yo, we all go through trauma. You're not alone. Like, let's talk about it. Yeah. We'll, we'll figure it out. It's going to be okay. Let's let's just talk about it. Thank you so much. I want to lighten up the mood because that was heavy. <laughs> <laughs> that was heavy. That was heavy. Uh, uh, let's lighten up the mood. I want to play a little game with you since you're an ELA teacher. You know, ELA, ah, 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 riders in the house. <laughs> um, so um, I just want to let you know, Yasmin, because um, the coach in me is like, um, when you going to write that book, though? everyone keeps saying this to me I don't know you that I don't write a book <laughs> yet. you I'm know what I see you more so I can see you're more of a vlogger I've been thinking about that yeah there may, be a, a, there may be a vlog there may be um an Instagram the Instagram page may grow in a sense of just uh creating that space for my experience to be memorialized so that people can look back on it. But right. I'm not, I'm just not sure how I want to organize it yet. And I'm very analytical in that way. Okay. I well, the whole plan. <laughs> you need any support, you need some consultation, idea generation, reach out to me mm -hmm. and I'll help you figure that out. But it would be in your best interest um, to do that because you could be a whole motivational speaker for women that are going through this because it's an audience that's overlooked because they feel ashamed. I feel like I'm not a woman because I can't procreate. Absolutely. I feel like it's so much. It's, it's so, and the reason I, I can even say that is because I could be in that group, but I don't want to say it. And another thing I want to say is that God is good because I watched that testimony. I watch y'all shed tears I watch you guys share your story and your struggles and both of you women are pregnant right now Carrie mm. just had a baby in December <laughs> God is wow. God. but but God but God but God but God right society doctors anybody could tell you anything but God okay she went through the same thing as you she wasn't she didn't want to share and tell anyone you know, she had her time. I'm, I'm not going to give all her story because I hope that she'll come and share it. But I think when, when she texted me on December, whatever, and she, of a picture of her baby, I got emotional because mm -hmm. I was like, I was able to see the beginning. But two years passed and I saw that God came through. You just got to be consistent. You just got to be there. You got to keep it going. That's what I see. That's why I'm big about my faith. I'm loud and sharing because that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing women that thought this couldn't happen for them. Yeah. And two years before, feeling down, broken, hurt. Crying. 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 And wow. two years later, he kept his promise. Mm -hmm. God keeps his promises straight up. Anyway, <laughs> let me bring it back. <laughs> I was trying to avoid it, but I was like, I gotta, I <laughs> had to say that. Like, I was like, yo, we was on this panel. It was in 20, yeah. 20 October of 2020, y'all. Go look it up. And how, how crazy is that, that, you know, she just had her baby, I'm pregnant right now. Like, this is so wonderful, because you wanna, even though it hurts. And then let me make it even better for you. There was a third person, I'm not gonna leave her name anonymous. When she's mm -hmm. listening, she's gonna know it's her. We, you know who that other person is. She's due next month. The baby shower was the baby shower that I had to miss. All those women that were coming to me about this in 2020 are, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I was just like, what, what? 2022 is that year for us. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's something great that's happening in 2022. All that pain, all that sacrifices that we've made it's, it's coming to pass. Mm -hmm. It's coming to pass. All right. <laughs> so let's play this game. This blame is going to be name that cinnamon. Cin cin 
Cinnamon? <laughs> I said no, cinnamon. I, I don't name a few cinnamon. Cinnamon. <laughs> Nate, so you got, I'm going to tell you a word and you're going to give me a cinnamon. A cinnamon. <laughs> Synonym. <laughs> I don't know why I keep saying synonyms. Synonyms. <laughs> synonyms. Okay. Right. That's when you say another word that means the same word, yeah. right? Okay. It has so same same <laughs> okay. So you're going to have 30 seconds to get through as many as you can. Oh, boy. Okay. okay. Each one that you get correct, you'll get a point. Okay. All right. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. like trying to get my, my stuff set up. All right. All right. So the first word is receptionist. Mm. Ooh. Three. Boy. Receptionist, really, girl? Assistant? <laughs> Media. <laughs> <laughs> Media. Communication. Tool. Equipment. Okay, okay. Platform. Stage. Mm. Okay, okay. I'll take it. I don't know, Papa. <laughs> I don't know. This one is an easy one. Afraid. Fearful. Nice, nice. Okay, okay. I should have did a I should have did a, a different game with you. You got <laughs> Well, we did just work on synonyms and antonyms. <laughs> so <laughs> You know, <laughs> you you definitely got it. Let me do it. We gonna finish that tune. I gotta give you a different game because all of that stress you done got me crying and stuff. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we gonna do finish that tune. I'm gonna tell you a line of a song. I'm not gonna sing it. You are gonna have to figure that part out. Right, I'm gonna just say the line of the yeah. song. And you gotta finish that line. Okay, you ready? As ready as I can be. All right. You ready? Okay. We were lovers through and through. Oh, I know the song, but I don't know the next lyric. <laughs> you know, some some stuff you just hum to, and some stuff you sing the lyrics to. Mm-hmm. Okay, got ones. you, got you, got you, got you. Go, go, shorty. It's your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> You got that one. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Good job. Okay, okay, okay. Did you know little Brooklyn? Yeah, but that one is a little tricky because I feel like it was all a dream is in like five different songs. So really, I was just relying on the Brooklyn of it all. <laughs> you already know. You already yeah. know. Brooklyn, home of the greatest rappers. <laughs> Big comes first. <laughs> all right, let me stop. Yes, thank you so much for playing and playing along. It wasn't as intense. You nice. You got that. You got that trivia spice to you. I'm jelly. No problem. <laughs> All right. Say that one more time. Close up. No, I said you got that trivia spice. Like you have oh, your yeah. good hello, hello. Those type of games. Like you really like on it. All right. I thought thank I was you. gonna get you to struggle <laughs> a little more. Thank you so much. So right now we're gonna start winding down our conversation, and I kind of just. You know, before you leave, I would like for you to share um, one piece of advice that you would be that you wish someone had told you when you were younger that would have impacted a decision that you have made that you could share with someone now. Regarding regarding this situation that we spoke about. It could be anything. It can be, but it could be anything. Just you, you're a whole person right now. And all your experiences help to make the person you are right now. And in all those experiences, okay. what would you tell somebody that you wish someone had told you when you were younger? Um, the doctor is not the evil villain. Mm. As a kid, the doctor was the evil villain mm. of my life. Mm. What do you mean you by know, my mom had to do a lot of prep work? So I'll share a, a micro story. Okay. Okay. When I was really young, um, I was I was very afraid of needles, um, like most kids, but because I have anxiety and had it as a kid, it was very intense. And so my mom had to read me this book about one of the Sesame Street characters going to the doctor. Before mm -hmm. every doctor's appointment, 
so that I could create a routine and understand when there's going to be a, a shot involved, which is almost always when you're a child because vaccinations. <laughs> One day, my mom must have had work or something. My grandmother took me, completely went off the routine. <laughs> so already she done brought me to the villain's lair and we didn't read the book. And now because I associate the book with the needle, mm. I figure we're not reading the book because there's no needle. We get in there um, and the, the nurse comes up with the needle. She's got the, the little rubber band around my arm. I'm like, oh, this is not, this is not it. This is not supposed to happen. This mm. lady is a true evil villain. <laughs> She's doing this behind my mom's back. So she, and I was like five or six. So anyway, as soon as she puts the needle in, she's drawing the blood. The doctor turns around and I ripped the needle out and threw it at her. Okay. Fast forward to today. You a bad <laughs> I was just, you know what? I've always been very rebellious and always been very much. I'm going to, if something's not right, I'm going to make sure people know that this not right thing is happening. So I did that. And everybody panicked um, because now my blood's all over the floor. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, mm -hmm. fast forward mm -hmm. to today, I have to give my own self needles and doctors have been so, when I wanted to give up, mm -hmm. you understand when I wanted to give up, doctors were like, there's no reason for you to give up. You're going to be fine. Things are going to be fine. Oh. And a lot of times, um, especially in this infertility world, these doctors, yeah. I want to speak specifically about these doctors. They really, really want you to succeed and will exhaust every measure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when I couldn't root for myself, when me and Francis were both just out of faith, hope, everything that you could imagine, these doctors were present, they were smiling, and they made, they, they were the heroes. Mm. They were the heroes of this story because I was going to give up a couple of times. <laughs> wow. I was looking at adoption. I was looking at all of the, I was like, my body's just not going to do it. That's okay. I'm going to make peace with it now. And the doctors were like, you have a good uterus. <laughs> and all the other things that they said to give me confidence in myself when I didn't have it. So the doctors are not the villain. And as by extension, they can be the heroes. Wow. Thank you for that. That blessed me because I definitely don't really, I, I feel like they're about themselves. Like. You got to find the right one. Some of them are really about themselves and they will, clip your fingernail and call it a surgery. But others, you know, others, much like teachers care about their craft. Mm -hmm. And the way we feel about our students mm -hmm. is the way they feel about us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Thank you so much for that. That, that would definitely bless me. Um, thank you for sharing your story and being brave as usual. You got my little tears. <laughs> going um right now i want to just give you an opportunity to promote if you want to put it out there your page if there are any women out there that's listening that may want to follow that special ig page if you want to put it out there if there's anything else that you're working on that you want to put out there um this is your time to shine go ahead girl all right well i mean i it's only this i'm not really working on much i'm trying to you know take an extreme backseat and relax um, but the page is called Sweet Double Rainbow. Sweet no Double Rainbow. Yes, because when you have a miscar when you have um, a baby after a miscarriage, it's called a rainbow baby. If you have a baby after two miscarriages, it's a double rainbow, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I didn't so know. This is my double rainbow baby, which is ironic because when I first moved to Connecticut, I took a walk on the beach and I saw a double rainbow because it was raining the day. Wow. Okay, that's nice. When we first started too. So Sweet Double Rainbow is the okay. page. Um, you'll have to scroll all the way to the bottom to, to get to a picture of me because it's mostly pictures of meds and funny things. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, you want to read the, read the captions because the captions are the story. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I can get, I can not only get an idea of your experience, but I'm also getting education about the process and these things as well on the page mm -hmm. some stuff, some stuff. Mm -hmm. so thank you so so much i i haven't even gone to an expert to talk about this but just from what you've told me has helped me a lot and i was able to use that and go um mm -hmm. to the doctor but thank you so much for being here I, i'm glad that you were able to stop by and make time on our day off i'm about to let you go <laughs> so we could self-care um 
but I, I I really feel that someone is going to be you know delivered, restored, inspired by your story um as I was and. Thank you so much again for coming through. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, like, and I'm sure you've seen, everybody's seen me. I'm a little different now. I've been saved and all that. <laughs> and um, really and truly, I, I believe that God saved my life. Um, I was in a dark place. Whether y'all knew it, saw it or not, it that was what was happening in the background behind the scenes. And um, I'm just thankful that I don't look like what I've been through or what I've been going through. And um I, I, I don't say it as a force or impose, but I always give people the opportunity if they want me to pray for them or like an opportunity for me to share what my coping skill was um, that helped bring me out of my dark place. Mm -hmm. And so right now, if you would like to, I would love to pray for you before you go. Um, and then that will be it. For me, um, being prayed for is like a, a super sacred thing. So I, I always like it in silence. Um, mm -hmm. I don't like to, I don't know what it is, but I don't No, I do know what it is. And that's a story I'll tell you off camera, but okay. I just very much appreciate, I appreciate prayers, but always in my absence. Copy. You want someone to pray for you. Yes. But, distance, but you don't want to like hear it. I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to be there in the space. I will really explain this to you as soon as we get off this call. Okay. I feel like I kind of got an idea, but you will explain it to me. <laughs> okay. So, so just so you guys know, I will be praying for Yasmin um, privately. Um, thank you so much, Yasmin, for being here. And if anyone's listening and you felt moved, she said she does like prayers um, in private. So definitely lift her up in prayer. Pray for that baby, you know, that it comes in July and it's a happy and healthy baby. Um, clearly that um, God is in it. God's hand is on your life um, and he keeps his promises. Thank you so much um, for listening and stay tuned for the new episode next month. <laughs>